All right, I'll call the meeting to order at 6.05. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, her God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. All right, first order of business is to approve the agenda. I'll move to uh, approve the agenda with the uh, deletion of uh, D1. Uh, under policy, uh, that was put on there by mistake. Are there any other uh, additions, deletions or corrections to the agenda? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, general public comment. Is there anyone from the public tonight who wishes to speak? All right. We'll move on to the consent agenda. So you might have noticed that the consent agenda might look a little bit different. So I wanted to try and utilize the consent agenda as it's intended, which is uh, reoccurring matters of business, um, of regular meetings. Uh, can usually be approved under the consent agenda in one motion. So the idea is, is um, minutes, warrants, uh, hiring, all that stuff can be put into the consent agenda to um, basically save meeting time. We don't have to make motions for everything. Um, I would ask that if anyone uh, wanted to discuss anything within the consent agenda, uh, we can move it out of the consent agenda into the uh, onto the agenda if there were any questions or concerns or uh, in like we'll say the case of like the minutes if any changes needed to be made but now would be the time to do that All right, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I'll make that motion. Motion by Matt. I'll second. All right. All right, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, superintendent's report. Okay. Uh, thanks, Eric. Just a few items to go through. Uh, the NWA maps testing has been uh, completed. You know, Rick and Carol will talk a little bit more about that when they uh, do their superintendent's report. Uh, we are looking to, uh, to provide information to the board probably at the December or January board meeting, so that we can compile all that. Uh, really would have just give us just uh, kind of our fall scores, just kind of see where we're at. And then uh, we'd be looking at uh, you know winter just for comparison standpoints, but we will have some of uh, these NWE map reports for you. Along those same lines, I know we just received some information today from the AOE. This was not on your reports because it just it came when I was at my conference this afternoon. Um, and, and Rick and Carol haven't even heard about this yet, but they'll receive more information. Uh, we did receive a word that the, uh, the state is uh, moving away from SBAC uh, and they're moving to a new test uh, uh, for this spring. Uh, so we are waiting for more information on that. Once we have more information, uh, we'll be sharing that with the administration as well as the families about what that will look like um, and what it, sort of impact that will have uh, on us for this year. Uh, I'll be honest, it is a bit frustrating just because the fact that we look at from, uh, from you know, prior to COVID, now we have COVID and just, you know, we continue to have these assessments and will there always be an asterisk next to them in terms of, you know, interruptions. Um, but uh, the state has made a decision to shift and like I said, once we have more information on what that's, uh, the new test looks like we will uh, send that out to us and and uh, you know Rick and Karen will talk a little more about it next Thursday at our admin meeting and we should have some more information by then. All right, thank uh, you. Um, GRCS UN service day is uh, this Friday. Uh, this is an opportunity really just uh, for do some building level things as well as uh, district and SU wide uh, particularly around MTSS. I know the uh, the K through two 
uh, has to do a lot with what's called fast bridge. It's just a, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it's a tool that's being used in, in you know, along lines with MTSS to help identify uh, deficits and strengths uh, with our students. Um, but like I said, I'll let them talk a little bit more about that because they will be uh, helping oversee that, uh, that professional development. So to do plan, we did have our first meeting uh, on Monday. Uh, it was, you know, so thanks to Eric who was able to make it and, and Rick and Carol were there. And, uh, but it was a, a good kickoff. I think in that meeting, we just kind of talked about uh, just the importance of graduates as well as just our kind of our goals for the process and start to you know, think about you know, where we want to be at and start to uh, begin to identify priorities. Our next meeting is on November 7th, uh, is at, in person at West Rutland. So anybody who can make it, that'd be great. But uh, as we go through the process, uh, we will be providing updates to the boards, uh, just kind of see what kind of where we're at and if there are uh, opportunities for feedback, you know, Sue or Matt or Amanda, you can share with Eric as well, you know, just, or myself or, or Rick or Carol, uh, just, you know, feedback or just your thoughts and we could bring that back to the committee as well. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about is just uh, the professional learning that myself, Rick, Carol, and Lisa Madison are uh, kind of are going. Last year, the admin team went through what's about the University of Washington Center for Ed Leadership, Instructional Leadership Program. Uh, Rick uh, went through that, but then, you know, you know, with COVID and with a variety of other issues, uh, staffing had to uh, kind of step back a little bit from this, uh, or from the last spring. We were able to get Rick back into that this year, uh, and Kara obviously being first year. So they were kind of going through, it's kind of a 1.5, so it's kind of in between a year one, year two, uh, but it is a program that the, the four of us are undertaking. It's a you know, year long and really focused on just improving the quality of uh, feedback. I know we talk, we, we look at, uh, you know, the, the single most important factor, at least from a school's perspective, on student learning, that is the quality of instruction, the second most is the quality of the uh, building principle. And so this instruction and leadership really focuses on both, is, you know, having myself and Lisa continue to work with Rick and Carol and the quality of feedback that we provide to our staff and uh, in terms of, you know, accountability, in terms of, you know, providing high quality instruction for all of our students. And so there's a, a trickle down. So it's a great program. We've seen a lot of benefits for this. But as we go through Rick and Carol, and I can you know, kind of talk more about that. So, um, and the rest is just more informative. We do have the VSBA, VSA annual conference uh, coming up on the 20th and 21st of October. I know that Eric is going to be there. Uh, if you cannot attend, uh, you did learn that there will be a recording uh, through a webinar, so I will send that information out to the board as well. So those people who can't attend in person can view that later on as well. Uh, so you just kind of see what was covered uh, at different points of discussion. All right. and, uh, and just a reminder to, there's more to Middletown Springs about the Helen Henderson Education Trust. Uh, information has been sent out to uh, family, the graduates of 2022. Uh, so the deadline for that, just to make sure, is November 30th. So if you are interested, please uh, fill out the application and get that in. If you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or to, uh, to Rick and we'll get that information to you. So, right, thanks. Great. I have a question. The, uh, the supervisor union set out a survey that was for like the strategic plan, yes. right? Um, do you, what do you have, um, have you been getting like results back on so that? So I, I can view it uh, because that's going through our facilitator. That information is going to be used for the second meeting. Uh, and we I think we've had probably close to 80 respondents. Okay. Uh, so it's been pretty good response from there. Uh, the feedback has been good. Uh, basically it's just about, uh, I guess, you know, I mean, hopefully you've seen that. It was a, a, a longer survey. I know Sue, I think it was the last meeting we talked about surveys and uh, your thoughts on this, and you know, sometimes you know, the longer survey, the more the return is for someone to fill it out. Uh, but we did have a good uh, respondents from a variety of our communities, uh, with some good honest feedback about uh, their thoughts about where we're at and where they would like to see our, our schools go. Um, the one concern that we hear, and it's something which I've talked about since uh, I, I started, was uh, we're not trying to create you know, identical schools across our SU. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose really is to just ensure that all of our kids have access to 
uh, the Nessar programs, resources, and have access to high quality instruction. And, and we, so we understand that there's a delicate balance of you know, moving that forward, but also still respecting you know, communities and community, you know, identities and, and you know, some of the great things that are going on in each of our schools. But we want to make sure that all of our kids have access to uh, the resources they need to be successful. Yeah, that's what I, I was, why I wanted to inquire, like, because if that information is going to be used in the next strategic plan process, the more people who participate. Um, we'll, we'll probably send more information out. I'll, you know, I think myself and Lisa Madison will send a reminder. I think we've asked Rick and Carol to include that in the newsletters as well. We'll probably shut that off probably in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so then uh, we'll tell the, the group that's facilitating, okay, just kind of, Collect it, you know, put it, present it to the November 7th meeting. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for asking. Any questions for the superintendent? Yeah, for, for the maps test that the kids just did, yes. um, will, the, will there be another like presentation to the board in terms of like where the, the kids' strengths are? And... Well, yeah, we so maps, the fall maps really is a, it's like a baseline right kind of provides us an opportunity to see where they're at and so yeah. uh, then teachers can set goals for you know for the midwinter for you know, the, it's in February they'll be tested yeah um, so we will we'll present we'll take a look to see where we're at with this and then we can actually do a comparison from last fall to this fall yeah uh, so we can ask our, our you know uh, Al Gorich to prepare that and then right. we'll be able to present that yeah I know last year there was there was no comparison points because we decided I guess it was skewed because of COVID. Well, no, the map, the reason why last year was the first year we were able to do map with fidelity for the whole year. Okay. So we started map, it was the, uh, the first year we started map was the first year COVID hit. Oh, so then I we see. shut it down and then we did not do map the following year. And I then, see. So last year was the ones of fidelity. So we have a full set of map uh, you know, scores from the year. So fall, winter, and spring. So we could look at the fall of 2021, fall of 22. So great. If uh, like my child say in third grade, we could look at the second grade and we look at third grade just to see growth over the course of the year, or if there's regression, and then we could talk a little more about how that will be used to inform instruction and curriculum and lessons from now to the winter. Awesome. And I remember when we were looking at those, we couldn't get view in a certain topics. I think because we didn't have. Uh, it met some threshold with the number of students. So, so there, there are conversations that we can have in executive session. Okay. Uh, they're in a public session. You know, when the, you know the, the number dropped so low, and a lot of our, our cohorts are relatively low, and said so they fall below the threshold that we can't discuss it publicly because it might, you know, have some identified information. But we could, as a as a board, move into executive session where we could look at that information uh, there. So because okay. that would be shared publicly. Okay. I was going to mention if you're if you're presenting it and you're cutting up the data, maybe combining both schools and certain subjects versus individual. We'll, yeah, we'll take a look, see okay. what we do. So sure. perfect. Yep. That'll awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. Um, question on the new testing that's going to be done. Is there software involved in that that we have to purchase, or is that going to be something that's going to be provided to us, or do we have a clue what the heck's going on? Uh, as of right now, we don't know. Like I said, I received a memo this afternoon, and I know uh, I was at a conference with, with Lewis and Lisa Madison, and I shared these, you know, like, it was like, just give me some time to process this. Uh, but I think it's one where I think it's going to move pretty quickly. But uh, this is part, sometimes the frustrating thing about the state is to make these decisions not really understanding uh, the impact and how it's going to, to you know, affect us. So, so there could be software purchasing that's going to be involved, or no? That I don't know. That, Potentially, I guess, yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, if it Didn't becomes we just a purchase the last thing just a while so, ago? Wasn't there a purchase of the last testing that they tried to do, the new kind? I'm trying to think, but then again, my last thought was that six years ago when I was on the board. So maybe so, it's old by now. So, I mean, we'll have a better understanding yeah. in November uh, when we meet again. Like I said, we'll have information I'll, I'll go out to the boards. I, I know that uh, Lewis, Obviously, we'll take a look at from a budgeting perspective, but uh, I, I don't think, I, I think the state is well aware that we're in the middle of budget cycles, we're budgeting, and then to to drop something like this on, I think they'll have some sort of plan in place for us. Sure. So, uh, I I'm trying to be optimistic here. So. Okay. Yeah. Glad you are. Well, <laughs> I think it'll be really interesting, though, too, because they're starting new testing. You know, we'll have to wait for two years worth of testing. 
to have a comparison? Well, I, I, regardless of what, and this is, you know, like I said, I've you know, worked in Illinois, worked in New Jersey, now in Vermont. I think one of the things is they're all still will be linked to the Common Core standards. Okay. And that's something which the standards will not be any different. So whatever that test is, like say New Jersey was park exam and you know, Illinois had a different exam, but they're all were linked back to the standards. So the work that our, our the curriculum team has done, the work that our classroom teacher doing, it won't be an impact for them because they're, they're still will be assessed on those standards. It really would just be well, what that test looks like. It just, we don't know as of yet what the test is. Right. So it's not gonna be a, a, a major shift. Like I said, our teachers will continue to do the things they're doing because to the same standards they were doing yesterday will be will be impacted by this. But could we, could you like compare SFAC results compared to this? That I don't know. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that, that, I that's a real good question. That I don't know. So, okay, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll wait. Yeah, I think once we learn more about this, I, I, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to wait to see what it looks like and uh, what the state rolls out in the next couple of weeks. So. All right, okay. Sorry, I keep asking, but sort of, we're in the weeds here, but is it uh, once a year or is it multiple? The It'll still be offered during the spring, once a year. So. Once a year, okay. All right. Move on to principal's reports. Wrong paper scissors. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll go, go first. So just to build upon the conversation about fast bridge, SBAC, and, and MAP testing. So uh, our new MTS model will stand as multiple tiered systems of support. Um, each school is having a, a dedicated educational support team. We're meeting two hours a week, which really for me, for a small school, is a pleasure to have that dedicated time to look at that data. One of the surprising thing is where you actually get to line up all the data from, from all the students um, that are struggling and you compare tests, like a student may be struggling in map testing, but in the fast bridge, which is um, assesses in a different way. So you're having all these different lenses. So it's difficult just to, to have you look at the map testing without seeing a full picture. And I mean, it, we have students who did quite well on, on the SBAC testing but, but didn't do well on the map testing, and you're going, well, all right, so what is this data, tell, data telling you? So this, it's this rich conversation that we're having uh, two hours a week. It's a dedicated team, and we bring teachers in that have those students to have those discussions and, and talk about strategies. Well, is it really, what's the data sh showing? Is that student really struggling and having those conversations about the work they're actually doing in the classroom? So, so it's, it's tough to, especially for a small school to look at one data point and say, and I, I'm not sure it gives you a full picture of how the school's doing. I, I, I know optics is, but um, it's been some really surprising and things and actually some growth too. And I do like FastBridge. I know it's, it's not quite as difficult to give, but also I think gives a better picture. Uh, the data goes deeper and it, it, it really does give you a direction of where the students are and, and what they need for help. So. Anyway, that's my, my two cents on that. Um, I, I want to thank the, uh, for all the parents and community members who came to the open house. We had a great open house. It's like, you know, it's like stepping back three years ago before we had COVID and uh, we had a, a potluck dinner and we had a community survey and kids were not running, but visiting all the classrooms Nothing around and, and pre, <laughs> most beautiful thing seeing a pre-K student take the, the parents up to upstairs the other classroom. They probably have never been there before, but it, it's just a pleasure to see that um, the the families and it was just a, a wonderful time. Um, we also started up something we had to to halt after for the start of COVID is what we call our cauldrons, where we have mixed little. Uh, it's like uh, advisory groups, but groups, but we have eight where. The plan is, the way we've had it before, is you, you have this one advisor group that you're with all your way through Middletown Springs. So say it's Sherry McNeil, um, if you're in that advisory group, um, you would be in that advisor group and we just bring more people in as people leave. It just builds that, that relationship with at least one strong person in the classroom, but just the impact of, of having the mixed level and, and kids supporting each other. And, and I think that's one thing we missed with, with COVID. And uh, I'm excited to have that back. Um, 
we have, we're having our first all school celebration, which is connected to positive behavior intervention and supports, which is PBIS. Uh, this is where the kids get recognized for, for their contributing to a positive school environment. And uh, so we're having a cider donuts and, uh, and, and uh, cider tomorrow, plus the staff are, are going out to play kickball with the kids, which is, you know, once again, building that strong community. And I can't say enough about relationships, relationships, relationships. That's what builds a, builds a strong school. Um, we are connecting with VINS again for some science and which has worked out really well for us. And uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of it. I think we've had a great start for school year and, and it's a lot we're trying to pull together um, with a direction, but uh, credits to the staff of, of hanging with me on it. So I appreciate it. Thank but, you. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, the fast bridge is that what SPAC is replacing? No, fast bridge is is kind of like the, the it's like map testing. So we do it three times map and and fast bridge are uh, two assessments that we do three times a year. Uh, the point probably at some point would drop. We're doing a comparison right now of fast bridge and, and map, and at some point we'll. Well, I don't guarantee, but probably drop one, which I think FastBridge does a better job at this point. Of so what we'd probably look to do is we'd probably keep FastBridge with their early ed, and then we'd look to keep maps for our upper grades. Uh, but that, that's something which has been discussed, but we'll, I think this year we're just having uh, everyone do FastBridge just through MTSS, and it's just, uh, just have you know, one common uh, data point, you know, and then, eventually so we lead ourselves off for because map will be able to do that as well with programs. So map testing is definitely is, is all computer based. So so part of the problem is you, you're testing then the, the computer based skills of the student and students come in at different places. Where for the youngest students uh, K through first, it's all teacher given. And they're they're pretty quick assessments, but they dive pretty deep into where the students are where Especially as you get up in the older grades, uh, some of the map testing you can take. By the time you go through all, we've had like a week and a half of, of kids trying to work through the test. It's not the whole day, but you know we give them a block of time, morning. It, it takes a long time to go through. So part of the challenge is is to engage a student that long in an assessment like that. So. So they're 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 doing maps and maps right at this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the advisory group, how does that work? So our, our cauldron, so we have the students split up. So like every, every, so the reason that they're called cauldrons because we're the wizards and Harry Potter and we have dragons and everything. So it's all based on that. So, so we have eight cauldron leaders and we put a, try to put a sixth grader in every, every group and a, at least one fifth grader in every group and, and down through and then we kind of split everything up. So the plan is that you'll stay with that cauldron for the whole year. Next year, unless there's a change of staff, you'll be back with that cauldron. If you have a sixth grader who graduates, you bring it in the next year's K okay, and you just kind of keep the person. So the whole idea is to build this really strong community relationship. You have peers that you, you've been with, a mixed grade level peer that you've been with since you've been, at, been in the school. And, um, so we did three years, I think, before the pandemic, and you could just see the community. And then we come together for an all-school meeting the fourth Wednesday of the month, and this is where we share cauldrons and we share what our learning is. And so it, I think it's a really positive thing that we haven't had for the last two and a half years. Is it once a week? Or? <laughs> once a week for 30 minutes. Like we had our first one today, so 8 o'clock. We disperse the kids, and they go to the different rooms, and and uh, then we send them back and uh, I, it, it's worth the time. I know it, it's, if you don't have a strong community and, and, and kids are feeling good about themselves, it, the kids are not going to learn, so. All right. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm going to go back to the EST process because having those two hour meetings has really brought a group of people together that can talk about kids, look through all of the results from MAPS testing, Fast Bridge testing. Our interventionist is new this year. And one of the things that she found, she really feels like she's pretty great at using Fast Bridge because she's used it for three years. And she was digging just a little bit deeper and she found that she can look at the data points that we get from testing from kids and go in and, and it will give direct interventions that she can share with teachers so they know exactly where to take the student and the needs that that student has and where they can go to actually help them build on that skill. So that's been real, I think that's been really positive and I have to say the two hours, although it initially sounds like a lot, I mean, the meetings are very focused and I, we have gotten a lot out of them. And I think the teachers are really happy with the information that's coming back because they're not totally responsible for doing all of It's a team. It is a team and it, and it really has a huge benefit to the school. And I think in the long run, it's helped a, a lot with pulling out the information that we need to pull out from the testing. And like Rick said, it's really interesting to look at maps versus fast bridge because for some students you look and say, how did that happen? Right. How did they how do they have such a different you know score for this? So that's another piece of it that we're looking through for the validity of it. But overall I think it's really gonna be really beneficial in a lot of ways to a lot of students, a lot of teachers, and just the community. And just to build upon that, so part of the the fast track is um, developing these interventions, but also track. And so we come back a six week session of, all right, so what are we gonna do? Say a student, or a group of students missing multiplication skills. So you come up with a strategy and ongoing uh, assessing, and then see if there is progress, so. And then I would just say, I'm gonna, our open house was on um, probably one of the worst weather nights of the year that we've had so far. And we had 71% of our families show up, which was awesome. And it was, you know, just kind of getting back into the swing of having community in the building. But we had, you know, the Cub Scouts here, we had our farm to school table. Um, our, our teacher came in because she's doing her portfolio. And so she talked to a lot of parents I think families were really happy when they came in and just being able to go around and visit in the school. We didn't do a potluck. I've heard from a couple of people that we should have, but we didn't get there. We did ice cream sundaes and cookies and people seemed genuinely happy with that. Um, one of my sixth graders came up to me the following morning and said, are we going to do another open house? And I think <laughs> it was just that whole idea of having the community together. They absolutely loved it. Um, and then the one other thing, I think we did go on a field trip to Castleton College. So did middle, uh, Middletown. And um, our bus drivers, who are not our bus drivers from here, said this was an absolute pleasure to drive the kids from Wells Village. They were amazing. And if you looked around the auditorium, I think you would agree. We had, we were really proud of our kids for how well they handled going on a field trip. Some of them had never been the college. It was a great program and it was really wonderful. They're looking forward to another field trip. Same for him now. Yeah. The bus, you were the bus driver. You were the bus driver? <laughs> yeah, he that's was some drive the that's bus here. sucking up the air. I got about 60 kids that I'd love to mix in with yours to see if I can get them to behave. Yeah. No, <laughs> our, our kids were, our, our students were amazing. And they really were. So and, and we are, <laughs> We are on our second school reward for PBIS. The first one we did a dance party. Tomorrow we're doing a snowball fight. How's that gonna go for you? It's all those fake sweet puff. The kit, it was their decision. We asked for ideas and the next thing we're working on is face painting and temporary tattoos. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's been great. Good. Any questions, any other questions? All right, thank you both. Uh, we'll move on to finance. Lewis. So uh, the main topic of discussion tonight is budget and finance. Um, if there's any questions about any of the reports, I can take those first. Um, we'll get right into this. <coughs> uh, it, 
did have a question about the um, the student activity accounts. Um, is there just one on here, or is this is it there like is there an activity account for Middletown? There should be one for each school. Okay. They're not one on the packet. Well, it just says uh, it says student activity accounts on here, um, but I can't tell exactly like. Okay, maybe this is it. There's just there's two pages and I guess it doesn't matter which kind of what, but I did have a question um, uh, that uh, there's a fingerprinting reimbursement on the student activity account. That's why I was like, I don't know how to tell. Probably middle school. Yeah, it's. It, I would okay, say it is middle school. Middle school. Middle school. Middle school. It is. All right, it is. It's probably the pre-K because an extra layer. To, to be working the pre-K program, it takes a whole other layer of getting um, picture printed for that. So. We have paid for it. Yeah, no, it was just kind of like a, a just a curiosity question. Yeah. Like, is that like a typo or is that like? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, for staff who are getting fingerprinted to be hired for the first placement, they have to pay that. We don't pay for But if there's staff that are already employed um, that are asked to get a second set of fingerprinting. Backups for the pre-K have to pay for them. Okay. In the last few years. All right. That's the only question I had. Amanda? I'm sorry. It's just a little hard to hear Lewis. I don't know. Maybe if he's just further away. You can make it out, but you really have to try. You want to slide up here? Okay. Yes. I'll talk more into the microphone. Thank you so much. Sorry. No problem. All right. Uh, anything else, Chloe? Okay. Uh, so we're looking at the first draft of the budget. Uh, it was emailed out today, and it was also included in the packet, um, in the uh, physical packet. Uh, so we are starting this process a little bit earlier. This is um, usually we don't look at the first draft until until November. So. We are being we're a little early in the process. Um, there's a number of pieces of information that we don't have yet, and so anything that you see that's highlighted um, in in the budget is stuff that's still pending. So like uh, tuition and invoices, we we do not have that information yet. Uh, we're still pulling that all together. Um, being that school just started, um, we have to compare rosters, compare invoices from all the schools so that we can get an accurate count of students that we're sending out. So anything that's pending right now, we are leaving at F last year's budget, so FY23 budget. And then as we go through the process, we'll update update those. I expect to have updates on most of these things at the at the next meeting in November. Um, all some of the other things that are still pending, um, any anything that's SU based, um, we took the first look at the first draft at the last SU meeting in September. Uh, we did a really quick uh, review of it and are going to. Do a uh, more in-depth focus on, on that at the October meeting. Um, so after that meeting, we'll update the assessments, um, any of the billbacks. Uh, also, all of that will be updated for the next round. Um, if you weren't at the SU meeting, uh, the general fund budget was up less than one percent. I think it was about eighteen thousand uh, dollars, and the special ed budget um, was up two point. Um, I think it was two point seven percent. Uh, but only 1.2 of that is an actual increase. The rest of it was just a shift. Um, it was reducing billbacks and but increasing the budget, which gets assessed out. So it was a net zero uh, increase in that portion of it. Um, the actual portion that was up was about 120,000 uh, um, that would be assessed out amongst all of the districts. Uh, but there's more information to, to come on that at the next meeting. And if you didn't get a copy of that in your 
that meeting was in person, so if you, uh, I don't think it was emailed out. If anybody wants to see a copy of that budget, just let me know and I can email it to you. <clears throat> and then, like I said, we'll go over the second draft at the next meeting. Uh, so looking at Wells Springs budget, uh, the first page is just some of the summary of changes. Some of the changes uh, that we'll go through are not on this. We'll have to discuss them in executive session. Um, so, so those pieces, um, I, I didn't put it in the packet. Uh, so looking at the budget right now, uh, we are up 3.4%, which is $184,000. And, and that's pretty much just bringing back all of our staffing uh, with the increases from the ESP and the teacher settlements, as well as an increase in health insurance. Right now, we are taking a shot in the dark. We have an, a 10% estimate in there, uh, which is approximately $31,000. Uh, we're hoping to have more information by the next meeting. Uh, Visbit has not given us an estimate yet, so we're not really sure what that's going to look like. Uh, we know we saw several years of double-digit increases. Last year was at a 5.2% increase. I would love to see something single-digit around that 5%, uh, or less would be great too, but um, it does really start adding up though when we look at double digits. Um, we're looking at um, Insurance now, well, it has been for many years, but when you look at a family plan, it's a significant part of someone's compensation. And sometimes you look at your lower paid staff and the health insurance can be more than their actual salary. So it, it does have a huge impact on budgets insurance. <clears throat> Educational spending, which is the amount we're raising in property taxes. Uh, it's your total expense minus your local revenues is currently up 4.3%. Uh, $213,000, and, and we'll look at more specifics on that in a minute. Uh, like I mentioned, tuition and other highlighted items are still pending. Um, last year, we finished the year with $182,000 surplus. Right now, I have that full surplus in the budget going in as a revenue, which is uh, so that the local revenue that's decreasing your educational spending. So uh, looking at the details, um, you go to page one or page two of the bu for budget. We would look at the, the revenues are at the top. Uh, so if you can look at the, I just want to point out a few things. So the fund revenue, that's where your surplus is. So I, as I mentioned, we had $182,000 surplus. But last year we had a $210,000 surplus. So we are starting the year um, with approximately $30,000 less in surplus, which is decreasing the amount of revenue that we're raising. And that's why we're seeing that educational spending is up compared to last year. Uh, tuition revenue is still pending. Uh, the, the big number there, that's our state revenue. And then the small school support grant, that number is a stable number uh, because we merged. Um, so that number stays the same until the, the legislature changed their mind. Uh, so then going to the bottom of page one, we start looking at the budget. The budget is broken down by sections. So first you're going to have the Middletown budget. Uh, and in, each, in, in the Middletown budget, you're going to have a different section for each department, in essence. So we call them functions. So the first uh, section is instruction. So that's where you would have most of your teachers. Um, you have your teachers, any regular ed IAs, your after school programs, and then all of the benefits and costs associated with instruction. So supply, supply lines, books, um, <clears throat> stuff like that. And then we also have any bill back uh, related to instruction. So your right now it's the special ed bill backs from your paras and uh, from, for last year it was paras and teachers. It was that piece that was in uh, and then. Continuing on from there is your technology, your library. So each department has its own little section. After you go through Middletown, you would have uh, the same thing for Wells. I and mean, I'm not going to go through each and every line, but I'll definitely I will take questions if there are any. Um, <clears throat> after you look at the, the Wells section, uh, there's the Wells Springs section. And so the Wells Springs section is anything that's a shared program. So the first thing that you have is instruction, and that's where you find your teachers that are shared amongst the two schools. So you have um, your, your foreign language teacher, your art teacher, your music teacher, 
and any other shared teachers. You have your shared librarian. Um, certain things that we, we did move to the uh, shared level, such as counseling, because there was a time when we had a shared counselor. Now they are separate, um, but we still have them at the district level. Uh, plan operations we have at a shared level, even though each one has their own staffing, um, but it, it is at the, the district level. And then um, some of the, at the end on page eight, you have your totals, which we've went over. So, but I'll go over those one more time. So total expenditures is up 184,000, 3.4%. And then education spending is up 213,000. As I mentioned, so most of the increase that you're seeing right now um, would be inflationary costs due to the settlement of the two contracts, uh, and as well as any in increases and changes in benefits. So if somebody shifted from a single plan to a family plan or a family plan to a single plan over the course of the last year since we budgeted, all of that would be reflected in here. The 10% increases would be reflected, um, as well as any feedback that I got from the principals on uh, changes in lines. I don't think there were very many, if any, um, actually like supply lines and stuff like that. Um, those have a minimal impact on the budget. The biggest pieces of your budget are staffing benefits and tuition. Um, and we'll go over staffing in more detail in the executive session. Um, so the staffing is in here based on current staffing. Tuition is just an estimate. That's the other thing that'll have uh, a significant impact. Ho hopefully we'll see a positive impact going into next month next review of the draft um, but we won't know that until we have those numbers together any questions on any of that yeah uh, Amanda um Lewis I see there's small numbers but there's a couple of sections like health and board of education and I think there was one other area where there's a travel expense now for 250. I'm just wondering why that was, what is that exactly? Under health services? Yeah. So that, that was budgeted last year, nothing was spent. Um, so that's just a, that is a travel line for mileage reimbursement in case the nurse has to travel um, to whether it be a, a training or central office or another school. Um, there's a travel line in a lot of the sections. Yeah. So instruction is it's just to cover mileage for staff members, and that's based on the IRS rate per mile. Okay. Uh, on on page six with the tuition, I know you said the highlighted stuff. You'll have more information. Are will that information, or are you waiting for like uh, you know for tuition to be announced for some of that stuff, or or so, just numbers on? We'll start the process using estimates for tuition. So we'll take what the tuition was this year. And, and I usually apply a 3% estimate. Uh, I'm not sure if that'll hold this year with the inflationary rates that all schools are facing. I know last year we saw some at three and then we saw like Rutland City increase their tuition by 14%. So um, I'll take a look at it at 3% and see how, what kind of impact that has. But the, the biggest thing is looking at the students um, so we take everybody that we had last year, we can take everybody that we had last year and move everybody up a grade, but then we also, we know there's also a lot of move in, move outs. Um, so we we like to really look at the rosters that we get from say Pulteney and um, Mill River and Long Trail so that we can see who's actually attending. And then we'll move those kids up a grade. Cause right now if we're working on last year's data, we're moving them up two grades and a lot of, lot of movement could happen in, in two years. So we rather look at this year's data and move them up to one grade rather than looking at last year's. And th this year's data is is just still coming in. Okay. Um, had another question over that. Um, there's another, I guess, kind of general SU question. It was had to do with transportation. Um, oh, it was on page seven. Uh, I know it's budgeted the same as you know for for this year. Did you expect that to go up significantly? Or I thought, um, I thought, don't we have a contract with them? Is it? So we are actually in our last year of our contract. Um, 
So we'll have to decide whether it's worth going back out to bid or uh, I think the contract does call for a increase um, at the CPI level. Um, so that, that is something that I will have to take a closer look at and I haven't had a chance yet, so that's why I still do have that attention. Yeah, because we did that, when we did that last contract, that was done. We did it when we merged, so and it was a five-year contract. Yeah, and it was done like toward the end of school year too, if I remember correctly. Um, I think we needed it in place for the first year of the merger, which yeah. would have been 2019. So we had 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 would be our five years. So next year would be the first year that we're, we don't have a current contract. Okay. Well, you can save the fun on that one because it's going to go higher in tech than we have to do for that one. Yeah, well, like that's done at the SU level, so it's going to be. It all trickles down from uh, that. Okay, Amanda? Um, with the after school program and the summer program budgets, I thought we had discussed. Um, maybe increasing those numbers? Did we decide that keeping them the same was appropriate? Or I, I noticed that they are the same, um, but I just thought that we had talked about since we weren't using the grants this year, you know, for now and next year, and then kind of the enrollment increasing and Middletown not being able to have it before with staffing. And I did we talk about increasing that or is, is that not a discussion that we decided to? So to address the after school programs first, um, so we do have budgets in there. Um, there's a Middletown budget of 25,000 and a Wells budget of, um, I think, I believe it's 12,000. Um, I do have the Wells budget item highlighted because they actually overspent their budget last year. And so uh, it does need to, I do need to take a closer look at it and discuss that with the, the administration um, to see what has changed with the program and why why we went over and do we need to either make structural changes to the program or increase that budget. And then the same thing with Middletown. So Middletown was way under. Um, so sort of vice versa, um, was there something that affected that budget to be under? Uh, can we shift some of those funds to well so that both programs are funded appropriately? Those are discussions that still need to happen on, on, on the after school program. But hopefully we have enough in those two lines to fund both programs for next year. Um, if we don't, it, it should be just a minimal increase uh, between what we've spent versus what we have budgeted when you add both schools together. For summer school, we have $3,500 budgeted for both schools, and that is not nearly enough to fund the programs that you have been having the last few years. I think this is a much bigger discussion and a discussion that we've started at the SU level. Um, when ESSER funds do go away, what is going to be, uh, what is the program going to look like? Is it still going to be a building-based program? Is it going to be an SU-based SU program with SU hubs um, and that the cost is shared amongst the SU, pro, uh, SU schools? Um, these are discussions that need to happen at both the SU level and at the district level. I think it's unsustainable um, unless you really want to see large increases in your taxes to, to continue the type of program you have been having. Um, uh, just, just for, for Wells and Middletown, uh, you spent, uh, we did, I did provide information at the SU meeting on the cost of the, each of the summer programs for the schools. And just in ESSER funds alone, the Wells program spent approximately $50,000. So that would be a pretty large impact on this budget. So I think those are discussions that we need to have in this, in this budget cycle, um, as well as next year as well. The impact won't hit. Well, Springs budget for next year because we do still have ESSER funds for another two summers. Um, but I think we want to start looking towards the future so that we can um, start moving in the right direction. Whether if this is going to be a locally funded program, then start planning appropriately in your budgets. And if it's if it's going to be an issue based program, we need to make those shifts. Start designing that program for next summer, and so that we can start making those shifts and doing that planning with ESSER funds. And, and this way, um, we can put that cost on the ESSER, and then when those ESSER funds are gone, we already have the, the structure of the program all planned, and it's just a matter of um, assessing that cost to the schools that are participating. Okay, yeah, I, I guess I would like to see us start, you know, with this budget that we're looking at right now, just slowly increasing, 
I know Middletown joined Wells last year, and I think that was great. But I also think for some families, it would be great to have it in both schools. And I agree, $3,500 is not nearly enough. So I guess my my preference would be to start slowly increasing it now and maybe look at increasing that 3500 even if it's just a little bit. Um, but I guess that's, that's all I have for that. So I think it's a great conversation, but also decide what the pro what the program is going to look like. Back when I, uh, pre-COVID, we had a four-week, uh, three-day program, and it was a pretty good program, so you could do a lot within that time, but, but it's a discussion, what, what does the community need? I know we've had a really, I appreciate the, the Cadillac program that Milltown Springs had two summers ago, and unfortunately, staffing, so, so it is a discussion, what do we want what does the community want to pay for? So, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also, I think also part of that discussion is, is it free to families or is it a low cost, even if it's only five or ten dollars per kid per day, which might help make up a little piece? Because right now it's been free to families, which is awesome, but maybe we just charge a little bit to make up a little of the difference or something. I saw, I read somewhere that the retail cannabis tax is going towards summer school, uh, summer programming. Is that is that something you know about? I haven't about heard or? that, so okay. I can definitely look into it. Okay. I'm not saying that that's like a huge, I don't know what it's going to turn out to be, but, and well, how they dis disperse that income. I well, Matt, I know that uh, two years ago when Senator Sanders uh, spoke to all the superintendents about this, uh, this additional funding stream to create summer programming. One of the concerns that the superintendents had was around uh, whether or not we were then going to become like a, a rec program for our schools. That's a, that in, in years past, we've always had no issues providing academic opportunities or rich opportunities, but were we now going to be like the summer camp for our communities? And so Senator Sanders was pushing that. And so we, we said it's difficult for staff and uh, a variety of models, but we also looked at that you know, funding cliff. I was like, well, when this money goes away, then have we created this you know, expectation that we would continue with this? And should that really fall upon the schools or the, or the districts, or is that more of a community based issue? And, and so I think, you know, and I've, we've not heard that as of yet. That might be something that we hear at the, uh, you know, upcoming BSA meetings around this. But I think it might look at more uh, creative ways to, you know, sustain this, these programs in our schools, provide more funding stream for us. But, uh, as Rick and, and Carol and Lewis had said, it, it is a discussion we're having in all of our uh, communities around w what that summer programming looks like and you know, what's the expectation. And, and really, to be honest, also what should fall upon the school's shoulders too, as well as the, the district's shoulders uh, for summer programming. Is that more of a community based issue as a school based issue? A question on uh, what's, a, what's a bill back? Uh, so, so there's many types of different expenses that it makes sense for the SU to pay for them because one of many different reasons uh, it could be it's a, a say a staff member that's shared across buildings or a staff member that is partially funded by a grant. Um, uh, so those are the main two top reasons. Uh, so the SU would pay for that expense and then that expense is then broken down into pieces and build back to the districts that actually use that expense. So for, for an example, so last year with special ed, um, if, you, if there was a paraeducator who worked in Wells and we, we, we assigned a certain percentage of their time as what we called in, in, ineligible under the reimbursable special ed model, which means that they're spending time on regular ed services that was not eligible for reimbursement under the special ed. Um, so, we took that piece and we would bill that piece of their salary and compensation back to the Wells School, Wells Spring School District. And then, so we have, at, when we look at the SU budget um, and we look at all the staffing that is funded at the SU, uh, we will also look at what piece of that staffing needs to now be funded, the, the remainder to get them to 100% by the other districts. And, and there'll be a, a separate sheet that I give out at the SU level, which includes all of those bill backs. Another example is, say, the interventionist at Wells. She's funded 30% through uh, the title grant, which is a SU grant 
So it doesn't make sense to split her up and have her get paychecks from two different districts. So she'll get her paycheck 100% from the SU. The SU will um, pay, cover the 30%, and then the other 70% we code to a special fund, which pertains to just wells, and then we'll take that piece and we'll bill it back at the end of the year um, to make the SU whole. Thank you. Any other questions um, that are not really staffing related, contract related? Um, yeah. So, so I think when we had a previous discussion, it, we talked about um, some of the surplus using it as like a reserve fund versus revenue. Yep. And I think you were leaning, I think your suggestion was to have it as like a reserve fund for facility and such because you couldn't count on the count on there being a surplus every year yep. and get people in the mindset that you know you know one year there's no surplus and the taxes go up or so forth so is this this is putting all the surplus no reserve correct doesn't so need a voting referendum or anything for that that's correct so right now this is built using that full surplus um, which, as you mentioned, is not necessarily a good idea because if this year we end the year and we have zero surplus, then when we look at building the following year budget, we're going to be looking at $182,000 revenue shortfall. Um, I would I would recommend that we take a piece of that. Um, we know we have building needs, um, and we know we're using some of the building. We've talked about using some of that building reserve this year potentially on repairs in in the two pools. Um, so I. It, it's a definitely something the board's going to need to discuss to see whether they want to continue putting some of that into the reserve fund. Uh, we have thirty-five thousand in there right now. Um, that the thirty-five thousand in the Well Springs Reserve Fund. There's also another fifteen thousand in the Wells Reserve Fund that is from pre-merger. Um, we also have not in reserve funds, but in the budget. Uh, there's a $35,000, each school has a $35,000 repair line, which is to pay for their daily repairs expenses throughout the year. But there is a $35,000 joint Well Springs line that we added, um, I don't know if last year was the first year, or maybe two years ago, um, that's shared. So once the schools have exhausted their $35,000, um, then they need to communicate and they can share that other $35,000 based on the school, the, district priorities before they tap into reserve funds. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. What was last year's reserve? Like, uh, we put in $210,000 into the, as revenue, um, and 35,000 into the reserve fund. 35? Yeah. Amanda? Um, I, I might just be missing it, but Lewis, can you tell me what the budgeted amount for like our facilities improvements and maintenance is? I'm not seeing that. It's on page. It's on page seven, uh, about halfway down the page. Um, so the total facilities expense that includes staffing and Electricity, fuel, everything is four hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars. That's what we have budgeted. The repairs line is thirty-five thousand per school plus thirty-five thousand for Well Springs. So the rest would be salaries, benefits, fuel, electricity, supplies, plowing, lawn care. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, do we feel like that is a comfortable number for the needs at Wells, or do we feel like we need to look at that? Just know there's a lot of building improvements that need to be addressed, and I just don't know if we've budgeted appropriately for that. Well, we have been building these amounts up, these repairs lines up over the last few years. Um, they're actually quite a bit higher than they were uh, when we had first merged. Um, and the 35,000 for Well Springs is a completely new line. The other school lines were, I think, were about 20,000 
So we have been building them up because we do know that there's a lot of maintenance that was maybe deferred in the past because that amount was so small. Um, it, it's all a question, it's a balancing act. I mean, how much do you want to put on the taxpayers? Uh, what kind of increase do you want to see in this budget? And, and so every, every dollar that you put into this line is one less dollar that, or one more dollar you have to cut somewhere else and one less dollar you can put somewhere else. So it's, it's really, what do you think the priorities are? And I know we, we still need to discuss um, staffing, but this budget is already at a pretty significant increase. Um, we know we were teetering on the edge of the, the excess spending threshold last year. So this year I'd imagine we'll get even closer. Um, the excess spending threshold is paused from FY25 to FY29, um, but there is still FY24, uh, uh, FY24, so there's the potential that we could exceed it for next year. Um, and then once that pause ends, uh, and the pause is due to the implementation of the waiting study, uh, which is supposed to have a positive impact on wells. We're, we're still waiting on some updated information from the state on the changes to that waiting study based on the changes that the legislators made, but as well as um, because we're now, uh, I think that waiting study is probably about two years old at this point. So just the changes in ADM and everything affected poverty rates, stuff like that. And I will say as far as like the facilities go, the facilities committee is, is looking at building repairs. Um, also looking at uh, a like a five year plan, including uh, building assessments, and those will really um, expose any major needs the buildings will need. Um, and uh, you know, but just a couple years ago, the the building re uh, repair line was thirty thousand, if I remember correctly. So I mean, it is going up, but. Um, I just worry about the cost of materials, I guess. Like, I know right now if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you try to buy something, you're paying twice or three times as much as you paid pre-COVID. And I just worry, currently, with our stuff that we have to fix, have we thought about just the natural inflation that we're going to have for materials plus the labor, right? That was my only thought with that. Like, a sheet of plywood now is $60, not 17 So, I just... Yeah. Yeah. So Middletown was at 30 and Wells was at 20. So we, we worked to repair some of those inequities to, to make um, that uh, FY19 was the first year budget. So um, I know, like I said, we've worked on increasing those. Um, and is there, is there a balance currently? Like do both, do both schools just expend that 35? Or, or do they, does it carry over? So if you look on that page seven, yeah. uh, it doesn't carry over. It goes into the surplus um, oh, unless it's the part of the reserve fund that they're spending. Um, but that first column is what was spent last year. So FY22 actuals. Uh, so Middletown spent 25 and Wells spent 24. So I can tell you this year, just between blowing out a hot water heater and some, some heat controls, uh, I feel pretty confident we don't need to take up. Well, for the, uh, the painting yeah. project. The, the painting, painting on top of that, but we just uh, we lost a hot water heater a couple weeks ago, um, and then there's uh, some J uh, some heating controls that we're going to have to update. So, yeah, so I feel pretty confident. Uh, I have something for you, Elizabeth. Um, I don't think so. It's where can you cut? Don't even give me that make you did that before. You can do it. I've seen you do it. Uh, I mean, you, there's two things you can do. You can nickel and dime all the little lines and try to, to save some money. Um, I'm looking at lawn care. What's I'm that? Looking at gar um, their garbage removal and stuff like that. Have you gone up a bid or do you bid for them? Uh, we we bid I mean, uh, trash removal. Um, and because some came out the cheapest. Uh, we bid it as an SU contract. Um, and Casella's was the only one that offered us an issue contract. Okay. There was discussions actually just the other day about not doing it as an issue and doing yeah, it locally. Idea. Um, so it's something we can look at. But again, these are small lines. So I mean, even if you save, so you can, like I said, you can nickel and dime these lines and maybe you can get 10,000 savings. Um, 
that 15, depending on how much you want to cut. 10,000 that he may need for another. Yeah, you Probably could definitely not. you could definitely find that. Um, but your your big expenses are salary and benefits. Well, salary and benefits that's a negotiation issue, and that's already lost, correct? He's already doing a three-year contract now. Three years for that, so you've lost that. There's no way you can fix that. Unless... Well, there are things we were talking about losing concession. Um, and then you're going to have to go to your smaller ones because you can't do anything with it. I would definitely start. Well, I, I, your I, budget's not passed. Going to pass. This is you can't keep raising these things. People don't have the money. They're not going to do that. I know one thing that um, we've discussed before, and you know, Lewis has brought up as well as about I think food services. Something I think the board should should discuss and consider. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at, and that goes back to what we were saying before about priorities, and as a high priority, and you know, keeping a a food service which is a little bit higher priced and uh, uh, you know, more of that Cadillac model, um, but at the cost of losing other things. Uh, but if we look at you know shifting to food service that is in line with our other two schools, and that would allow you to either reduce the, the overall line or allow for other items. Uh, I think there are there are items that I think should be discussed. I agree. We can't add to a budget that's going to be barely passing out. I don't see that. So I think what the board needs to decide, and not necessarily tonight, but I think we do need some feedback, is um, looking at where we are. Where do you want to see us at the next meeting? Where do you want to see us with our final budget, um, so that I mean, we have something to work towards and. We, do, we need to go back and look at every line to see where we can cut, and that's something where we do. But we need to sort of have a target in mind. We can't just do it blindly. Um, so we don't. If we're looking for twenty thousand, then we'll find the twenty thousand um, dollars. But we need to know what that number is. Is it ten thousand? Is it a hundred thousand? As far as I'm concerned, we'll see if we do a hundred thousand. But that's getting. But I, I'm the only one here. We'd have to, I think that would have to cut the staff in order to reach that amount. Uh, Amanda? Um, Lewis, what is on page five um, with the counselor service? What are the purchase services? So, purchase services are services, it's sort of it's like a bill back, it's a service that we're, um, so, so it is a bill back. So. It shows up, we call them bill backs, but on the budget, it's actually uh, the counting line, according to the state, is a purchase service. So uh, that line was set up when the counselor was an SU employee um, because they were also, um, in that case, uh, they were a special ed employee that was sh shared between special ed and counseling. Okay. Uh, that has now changed. So that will go away for this um, current budget. And actually, there's nothing budgeted there. Yeah. Uh, because both both counselors are employed by the district. OK. And I'm sorry, my last question. I'm also going back to page 7, kind of looking for, I see like snow removal, lawn care, all of that. Where electricity? Where's the heating? The oil? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. That's also a concern. Um, yeah, that's, that was my at, thought. I, I did look at that line and saw that we only spent 18 last year. Uh, we did have an extremely low rate last year. So I went out to bid two years ago. After COVID hit and oil dropped to below $40 a barrel, I went out to bid immediately and uh, did a two-year contract. And so we had locked in for $1.65 in FY21 and then $1.75 in FY22. Um, uh, so I went back out to bid this summer, and we are locked in for this year at $3.65. Okay. I, I wonder if kind of going secondary to that, I wonder if we should look at 
some of our facility stuff sooner rather than later. Because I think if some of our repairs were done before winter, then if possible, or as soon as possible, we could save on that, at least in wells. I think we, I don't know, just, it might not save a lot, but with the cost increasing and the adjustments that need to be made, we might want to look at doing that sooner rather than later. You did the fuel oil um, for like the whole SU, right? So the bid is the SU line, yes. But each school pays for their own fuel. Line. Yep. Um, is that coming up again at the end of this? So the 365 is for this current school year. So we're not locked in for next year. So get yeah. our fingers crossed that oil goes down for next year. Yeah. Um, it kind of like with, with the transportation thing though too, Evan, it, that bid's coming up too. And so those numbers can. Um, yeah, we know free oil is always a variable these days. Um, I don't typically lower our budget amount when we get a lower bid than we anticipate because I don't want to see our fuel line go up and down. So I sort of keep it steady there in the middle. So the, the budget is based on when fuel was at high twos, low threes. Um, so we can absorb some fluctuation. And so we had significant savings the last two years when we were at $1.65 or $1.75. So, I mean, it's, it's anybody's guesses what it'll be at next year. Could be at 250, could be at 450. So, um, I think it's it's at a good place right now. The budget. I mean, it probably wouldn't hurt to put a little more in there, but if you put it in there, then you have to take it from somewhere else. So. Uh, I had a question about um, substitutes. Yep. Uh, I know that the SU is uh, has a substitute coordinator. Uh, so. <coughs> All the all the lines for Kelly services. Um, did we really spend? Because I noticed there's a new line for uh, SU purchase substitutes. Did we? Did we have uh, over forty one thousand budgeted for all those? Yes. Before. Okay. So I took dollar for dollar how much we had budgeted in all the different many lines. Moved it to this one line. Okay. Um, we haven't spent forty-one thousand um, dollars, and that's mainly because uh, the last few years subs have not really been available. Um, our substitute coordinator has been doing a great job recruiting. She's out. Um, she's got ads out in the newspaper. She's going to job fair. She was at the state fair, um, so she's actively recruiting every day, looking for subs. So we can the, the sub pool is growing. Um, the offset to having more subs available is that you're going to spend more because you're going to fill more sub positions. Um, and that, so when you don't fill a sub position, you, you don't have any expense. So when you do fill it, so we, we will look at spending more money. Uh, in addition to that, we have increased the rate to remain competitive. So before our rate um, for paraeducators subs was 1255. Um, and it's kind of hard to get somebody ambitious enough to, to come into schools. For twelve fifty five, so we increase the rates to fifteen dollars an hour for all of our subs um, to help grow that sub pool, um, and I think it was definitely appreciated by all of our subs. All right, Amanda. When we made that change, um, did we cut substitutes in our buildings? I, I guess I feel like this year I just see a lot less subs available and helpers around and I, I didn't think when we made that difference that change that we had cut people did did we do that or is it just lack of availability we the only shift that we've made was during the first two years of COVID we had what we considered local subs so each building um, upon availability had a sub in their building every day as a floater sub and that was to cover those on it and anticipated um, absences the day of. So we still wanted to fill the open positions that were open days prior, but we knew based on people getting sick and um, just the atmosphere that we were in the last two years that there was absences that were occurring that day 
So each building had a person in their building to help to be a floater to help fill those absences. Um, those that local subposition was eliminated. That, we, that was ESSER fund. Those were ESSER funded. Okay. Do I maybe this is a Rick and Carol question, but do we feel like they were they're needed, or do we feel like they were helpful during COVID and they were eliminated because of COVID, and we don't need to look at that any deeper? Uh, just to go off on Lewis, Lewis, I mean, the, the new lady doing the subs is, I think, doing a great job, but still, we're not getting to the subs that we need. Um, and even the local sub last year, we've been short on people for two years, just the reality. So, Wells and Middletown have always been difficult getting subs just due to your, your location rurally. So, I mean, it's, it's just all about getting word out in the community and, um, and I mean, if there's a, a, a stay at home mom or a grandmother or a grandfather that would like to, is bored and wants to come in and sub for a day, then those are the type of people that are, that are great and that we're, we're looking for. Someone, um, a day here, a day there, that's one less absence that's unfilled. So there's a process where there's, they have to go through the onboarding process, but it's um, fairly straightforward. Um, but it, She's working, what? getting that, getting that word out, and there's uh, things on our websites, and um, like I said, it's, it's so if you know anyone in the communities that's looking for something to do, one day a week, one day a month, um, definitely refer them. Would we think that because of our location and our difficulty finding subs? It would be beneficial for us to have somebody every day, even if they alternated schools only in the morning until noon or something. So then we have a person. Is it better to look for somebody that's always there or no? I know I keep talking more money, but I'm just I'm I'm trying to think about what is beneficial. Well, staffing is an issue in general. We know there's staffing shortages locally, nationally, statewide. Um, I mean, we have pair of vacancies that our positions with benefits the local subs was a lower lower hourly rate with no benefits and we have pair of benefit pair of vacancies that are higher rate with benefits that are on filled um, so even if you we had local sub positions available uh, it would be tough to fill them and most likely you would be pulling from your sub pool in order to fill those positions so it's so that you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's not like you're just adding a, a position in your building. Uh, you're, you're pulling the resource from somewhere else. Um, and again, it would that would need to be a local expense. All right. Uh, well, we do need to have an executive session. So I think if, if no one has any uh, other questions uh, pertaining to those uh, non-personnel uh, we can uh, finish up the rest of the agenda and then just have an executive session uh, tonight to talk about those personnel related issues all right all right so uh, thank you Lewis uh, so we'll, we'll move on to uh, uh, old business uh, so we have the uh, board operating protocols this is just kind of uh, uh, it's the same document uh, just uh, looks a little bit different uh, and ba basically just uh, uh, for uh, the board to look over again for any other additional suggestions that hasn't come before the supervisory union board uh, like I discussed uh, uh, last month uh, so uh, any uh, suggestions for uh, changes or deletions um, uh, the one thing that I noted was uh, number 11 uh, uh, study sessions. Uh, I'm not even sure what that means as far as uh, <laughs> uh, board work goes. Um, you know, my first thought was is that could be that could potentially be removed. So, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. Hopefully, uh, everyone gets familiar with that document. Are there any 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 discussion on the board operating protocols? I have the same question. What's that? I have the same question as you about the study sessions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, 
my thought would be to just strike that out. Um, but uh, you know, we'll we'll definitely be seeing this again. So uh, so we'll just we'll just move on to oh, uh, the high voting member proxy. Uh, so um, last time we voted on the uh, Bizbit and the VS VA proxy, which uh, Eric established that he was going to be at the meeting, so therefore he'd be voting on behalf of the Wilson Board. Uh, about a week, week and a half after that, we received notification from VHI that will also be holding there, and that's the Vermont uh, Health Initiative uh, that we have in there. And you'll be on Friday morning at 9 o'clock, and so uh, the board will have to do the same as they did for the VSBIT and the VSBA. We need to be to uh, approve, you know, Eric to be, you know, represent the Willow Springs uh, board or would uh, appoint a proxy. For, so we just no. need action on that. I'd be willing to do it. I'll, I'll be there voting for a bunch of stuff. Um, if someone wants to make a motion or if somebody wanted to be the proxy, either way. And I'll make a motion that will be our representative voice voter you no I'm sorry that you would be oh okay all right yeah. all right motion made by Matt to make uh, myself the voting member uh, any discussion all right all those in favor please say aye aye all right motion carries all right thank you uh, policies uh, we have B2, F10, G1, G3, G4, G11, and G13 that are second reads. Uh, if there's no questions, we'd be looking for a motion to adopt these tonight. I believe these have been... I would make a motion to adopt them. I think they all look good. All right. My agenda. All those in favor of adopting those policies, say aye. 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 Any no's? The abstentions. Meredith, are you there? <coughs> All right, maybe she stepped away. Um, and you said yes. Okay. All right. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Can I, can I ask a question regarding policies? Not these ones in particular. Yes. Of course. Um, cool. So. So I saw recently that there was a school district in Vermont that was like cyber attacked with some transphobia um, stuff that made the news. Uh, just curious if there was, and that sort of be me thinking like, is there is there like an inclusion diversity statement um, policy that we have that we I don't know like a code that we ask vendors. Sign off on or um, that deal with the school as sort of a way to say, you know, I don't know, a signal that we are accepting. And um, I don't think so. I don't think okay. we have I, we have a an equity policy. Oh, Matt, there are certain uh, state regulations, federal regulations around websites. I can actually ask Craig Connors to come to our next meeting. So okay. talk a little more about that if you'd like. Okay. Uh, he answers those questions directly about. You know about uh, filtering, about security and privacy settings. That uh, as we work, with, you know, third-party uh, resources. Is that what you're asking about, or uh, more of like like this is this is how we operate. Like we are accepting, of, you know, something for vendors to I don't know to, to say that to sort of be out there to say you know we're this is sort of the philosophy we believe in. And I don't know. I know that a lot of organizations organizations do this. Uh, just sort of have like a code that. But they ask external vendors who work with them to, to sign off on and if that was something that I'll, I'll talk with uh, yeah. Greg and just see I mean, he doesn't need to come in if he wants yeah. to email me sure. individually we can okay. have a discussion all right yeah 
That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Was that? Uh, so I just, like, I just wonder if there's like a like a policy <laughs> that you had any expectation for for like vendors, um, any, any policy that we have for, for that vendors that have dealings with, with this, yeah. kind of, whether or not they're like they're so seeing if they're and I like if they're not discriminatory in their hiring practices, you know, things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean. Uh, are you uh, re referring a BT Digger article, or is this something else? I think recently, yeah, uh, there was something where a school website was taken over, and there was some. It just it, they're they're separate issues, but it just sort of uh, popped in my head. Like, is there is there something we have for for vendors, and they're they're unrelated, but sort of related. I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to think of. I don't. We don't. I know we don't have like a policy something like that um, okay. I'm trying to think we do have so so Matt I'll, I'll reach out to Greg because uh, I think I should say I think there are, there are two one is the fact that we I think it's asked about the vetting you know do we ask someone to sign off on a statement to say that right. basically just um, but I think also that we look at uh, look at our security just in, you know, in case something will happen how do we prevent that but so Greg will be able to answer those questions and if you basically yeah, have a conversation. Yeah, with, sorry, I think yeah. I muddied the waters by bringing up both both things, but yeah, sure. yeah, I can yeah. talk to him. Okay, great. Right. That's a good point. Um, never know. Something like that could happen. This could also maybe come to policy committee, Eric, if we add it for a discussion after we hear what Greg has to say. Okay, uh, so we have a uh, bunch of, actually, no, we only have three first read policies. Um, admission of resident students, the policy on non-discriminatory mascots and school branding. I uh, hope everyone read that one. And then uh, adoption, role and adoption of school board policies. Is there any uh, discussion <coughs> on these policies? One and one. Yes. Yeah, the state is. Okay. So that's that's uh, um, that was born because of uh, I think because of a, a rough district had mascot issues. No, we just had somebody. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to say yeah, that. So whatever it was, it uh, yeah. it went before the state board and then the legislature and. Uh, we have this policy um, that uh, is required is required by statute. Um, so, uh, so no no questions or uh, concerns any of these policies, Amanda. So I have a question on the admission of resident students. Um, I see where it says like the superintendent shall, shall consider the student's age and attendance, you know, going on that way. But um, I don't know if that clearly covers kind of what we talked about before about if a child has, you know, is a kindergartner somewhere else or a first grader somewhere else, but would be a kindergartner with us. How do we handle that? I don't know if maybe we need more wording around that, you know, if they were in kindergarten until... April and then they come to us in May. Amanda, but, so I think we, we actually kind of talked about this I think before yeah, when we were at the. So if a student say came from out of state, so say from New York, or you know, we'll say Granville to be more specific, uh, and they were in kindergarten and regardless of age, they came to us that they would be enrolled as a first grader regardless of their age. We would not send them back to kindergarten. They would put it a first grade. But would they have to complete kindergarten or would they come in mid-year as a kindergartner? I guess that was kind of the confusion for me on this policy. I think the same thing, if they if began a grade, then they would continue with that grade when they transferred in or enrolled. Okay, thank you. Other than that, I think they all look good. I would move 
room for second read. Um, we don't need a motion for these. These are if these are uh, here for feedback. Any suggestions for changes that would go uh, back to the committee? Okay, I think that uh, that wraps everything up. So uh, we are going to all move us into uh, executive session uh, for contracts that uh, premature general public knowledge would clearly place a public body or person involved at a substantial disadvantage. Uh, and we'll invite Lewis, superintendent, um, and our administrators into executive session. Um, and uh, do we have a second link? I sent it to oh, Amanda and our other. OK. So, could I also ask a question? I, I probably should have mentioned it earlier, so it's okay to tell me no, but I just had a question around um, our hiring of staff that I wanted to ask. Could I ask that tonight as well? Around the, the I'm sorry, the what? what? I just had a question about um, like the interview process and hiring of staff. It's a, it's a quick question. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I well. You, um, I mean, do you, I mean? Do you, is this about a specific staff member, or yeah. is it just in general? It's kind of a general local or SU question around how we hire staffing. Okay. I mean, so what would you, what's your question, Amanda? I, I was just wondering if when we if we hire a staff member that requires licensing, um, I was just wondering like if we assist them in getting that licensing renewed or if we look that that licensing has been renewed or if there's any process around that. So when we look to hire a staff member that requires licensing, uh, you know, the building administrator works with Christine McGinnis around and we work with uh, close with ron ryan who is the licensing individual at the aoe and we look at uh, what you know, what license they would need whether it be a provisional emergency license you know what it would take them and so we would then help them out uh, and set the plan but then it would be up to the individual to kind of follow through with that we have a variety of individuals in our SU right now who are currently working under provisionals which they're assigned a mentor and they actually have a plan with the state and they're working towards a licensure. We also have some individuals who work in an emergency license more uh, to fill uh, some short-term gaps required by just, you know, uh, leaves of absence, absences. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So for those who are, um, well, it's just Katie. Well, <laughs> just, just you, Katie. We'll, we'll come back to this meeting link after executive session. So, all right. So we're going to switch over to that link now. Um, oh, before we do, all those in favor of moving to executive session, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. And we'll do that at 7:39. All right. 